Welcome to the Tony Gaskin Show, best-selling author, celebrity life coach, and international speaker. The purpose of this show is to bring you motivation, inspiration, and education in the areas of life, love, and business. Thank you for joining me. Now let's get started. Hey, thank you so much for joining me today. I want to talk to you about something that's on my heart. You know, I've been seeing a lot going on in, in my line of work, getting a lot of emails and coaching sessions dealing with toxic relationships and how things are kind of getting out of hand, you know, domestic violence. I've had several requests to speak on domestic violence, and a lot of times we just see that as, you know, um, physical punches or being hit or being slapped or choked. But when you really think about it, if you go into a relationship or if you've been in a relationship and you saw not just physical violence, but emotional, you know, emotional violence, I guess you would call it, or even social people being isolated from friends and family. Then you have financial abuse, people being put on a unrealistic budget and not allowed to spend their own money that they're working for. There's so many ways that a person can be abused. And one thing that we fail to do in relationships is pay attention to the red flags. You have to pay attention to the red flags. And this is the beauty of dating because if you date and you take your time, and you don't have to date forever, but even 12 months, if you're dating for 12 months and you really like this person and you can see a future with them, then you have to take it upon yourself to make sure that you talk to this person at least one hour a day. Now, it can be in 15-minute increments or two half-hour increments or a full hour, you know, at night before bed or in the morning. And you may text throughout the day if possible, but you need to invest at least an hour a day. Now, in this process, you will get to see a wave of emotions. So if you take 12 months, inside of 12 months, a lot of life events should take place. So they may have a death in the family. They may have some income issues. They may have a fallout with a best friend. You and this person will have disagreements where you don't agree on certain things, certain conversations that come up. It may be around sex. It may be around finances. It may be around friends and family. And you're talking an hour a day. And if possible, if it's not a long distance relationship, you should try to date, like go on a date, go out on a date every week, especially if you're in the same city or you're close enough. Go on a date every week. If you can't, then have a Skype call, you know, or a FaceTime call if you're long distance to where you're looking one another in the eyes for an hour straight and you're talking and you're building. In this process, around three months to six months, you will then be able to decide if you want to be exclusive with this person. So like a decision needs to be made, a title needs to be put on the relationship no later than six months in. Like if you're investing time and you're giving this time to this person, you cannot start having sex and talking to this person and treating them like a boyfriend or a girlfriend, but not actually having a title. You have to be something so that you both know that you are exclusive to one another. Now, once you get that title, things kind of change. It's the same thing as going from dating to marriage. You know, things change when you get a title. Your attitude and your mindset changes when you go from intern to full-time employee. And you go from full-time entry-level employee to manager. And from manager to supervisor. 
and from supervisor to vice president, your attitude and your energy and your outlook on life and the way you look at other people changes with your level. The same thing happens in a relationship. When you get that title, a shift will happen. The shift can be good or bad. It can be a shift into complacency, or it can be a shift into a space of gratitude and appreciation. And different people, de depending on their mindset and the way they see themselves, the way they see their partner, the way they see relationships and love, that will determine what type of shift they have. Now, in this shift, you're going to see some things if you have someone who is who can be abusive in any way, shape, or form. The shift, the title will affect them. And you have to pay attention. And you have to look at the, the large offense first. So you begin with the end in mind, which when Stephen R. Covey said that, and I'm not sure if he created or he got it from someone, I'm not sure if they were thinking about relationships, but it still applies. You begin with the end in mind. And you have to think about what is the big version? Like, what's the worst case scenario of this type of, of abuse? So if the worst case scenario in your mind is being, you know, punched in the mouth and like really hurt. And let's say like a, a tooth knocked out. Let's say that's the worst. So now you break that down all the way down. And what is the first step that a person would take to getting to that place. So the first thing may be control. It may be the person telling you, you can't go there. You can't wear that. You can't hang with that friend. So it may be control. And this control may make you feel uncomfortable and it may feel unfair. So if you just go along with it and say, wow, okay, wow, man, this person is pretty protective, and you may call it protective, and that's what happens. A lot of times we mislabel things. So you say this person is pretty protective. No, this person is pretty controlling, but you call it protective. Now, the next thing may be when you slip up and you do what kind of comes natural to you. So you're used to dressing a certain way, so you dress that way. You didn't think they would have a problem with it. They see you with that outfit, and now when they get you in the apartment, they yell. What are you doing wearing that? Why do you have that on? You look like a such and such. You look like this. So now they're yelling. Now you may take and internalize this and say, well, they're yelling at me because I broke one of their rules, and this rule means a lot to them. And the rule is in place because they really love me and care for me and they want to protect me and protect my image and the way others are perceiving me. Versus saying, this is who I am. This is how I like to dress. This is me. Why is this person controlling me and suppressing who I am as a person? Why is this person trying to change me when I don't see anything wrong with being me? and dressing in this manner. Now, this could be anything, so don't just put it on clothes. Take and apply it to your situation. It could be you hanging with your best friend. Um, it could be you talking to your mother. It could be you going to a certain place, a certain church, a certain lounge, a certain hair salon. It can be anything that you have been doing this thing, whatever it is, and now they are trying to change it without really a valid reason and you don't really understand it, and it doesn't make sense to you. So let's say they yell, and you just kind of, you know, you take it on the chin, and you're like, okay, they're mad, they're angry. So then the next time, something else happens, and it may be in another, you know, realm. It may be you are talking to your best friend. And let's say this best friend is a friend of the same sex, so... You know, this is your friend. Your friend was there before this person. But for whatever reason, your partner doesn't like this friend. Their reasoning doesn't make sense to you. You talk to your friend. Let's say you're 
you're at the your, your home and you know your partner comes in and you're on the phone talking to your friend and you're laughing, kikiing, joking, and then they give you a hand signal to hang up the phone. You know, do the little throat slash thing, telling you, you know, cut it off. You know, get off the phone. So you say, hey, I gotta go. You know, such and such just walked in, and so I, I'll call you back. And then you get off the phone. And they're like, what are you doing? Why are you on the phone with? With her, why are you on the phone with him? Why are you? I told you I don't like him or her. Why are you talking to him? You know, both of y'all are just a bunch of little such and such. I ain't gonna say the word, and it could be anything. And this could be coming from the man to the woman, from the woman to the man, and now you're being called outside of your name, and now you're being accused of being guilty by association when you really don't see anything wrong with the association. So first it went from just this little bit of control that said, look, I don't want you wearing that. Or I don't want you talking to him or her. Or I don't want you talking to your mom three times a day like you normally do. You need to cut that back to one time a day. you know. So it's that control. Then it goes to yelling. Then it goes to name calling, calling you out of your name. It goes to verbal abuse. So now... It goes to verbal abuse, and you say, well, wow, man, you know, they really got mad, really got mad over that, and even called me some names, and I'm like, whoa, what's going on? Like, I'm not calling you any names, and but I'm not going to call them a name because I don't feel the need to. I don't think that's necessary. Why would I name call even if I'm mad? But maybe that's just them. That's just how they were raised. That's how, you know, their mother or father or brother or sister talked to them, so you know, I got to toughen up. I got to toughen up. It hurt me. You know, my feelings are hurt, but I got to toughen up. So now, again, you take and you internalize and you accept the blame for this. And then this may go on for a year, but the name, the yelling may get a little louder. The name call may get a little bit worse and then worse and worse and worse. So they start out calling you, you know, just like a, a jerk. And then it goes from jerk to like idiot. And then it goes from idiot to like, you know, a sexual term, what a guy would use or a woman would use, meaning that you sleep around and it escalates. Now it goes from there to a curse word in front of it. You effing W-H-O-R-E. So and it goes to yelling with it. So now you have yelling, name-calling, and it's all combined, and it's for an offense that you did that doesn't make sense to you but makes sense to them. So now you have this sea of emotions, and it's like, wow, what do I feel? Like, am I flattered that this person cares this much and is investing this much energy and sometimes that's how people look at it, like, wow, this person is really invested into this relationship. They care so much, like, who gets that mad over this? And in the beginning, if you have thick skin, it can be, like, cute. I've heard several people, you kind of see it as cute, like, wow, they care so much, like, got so mad. And you're talking to your friend about it later. Like, just got so mad over this. Like, man, I've never had someone that cared that much. And so now here you are labeling this as care instead of crazy and controlling. And this is how abuse sneaks up on us because we don't recognize the red flags. And it just escalates and it escalates. And some people, you know, for a person who is capable of abuse, which we kind of all are, if it is fostered and if it is reinforced, we kind of all can become this person. But if it's shut down, if it's called out, and if it's checked at the door, then we also, all of us can become a better person, a different person. So any behavior that is exhibited if it is recognized and rewarded, it will repeat itself. If it is checked at the door and it's called out, 
Now that behavior diminishes. And if it doesn't, then you have the right to walk away. So now you are not reinforcing this behavior. And so what happens is, is a person and a person who is capable of abuse, a person who maybe is an abuser or has seen abuse, this will continue to build. And they may break you down with words and with slurs for years. It could be five years, 10 years, and you just start to feel less and less of a person. And all of that is domestic violence. All of that is abuse, but you may be labeling it something else. And then eventually what happens is the yelling, the screaming, the cursing, the name calling, the belittling, the demeaning, all of that escalates and now something happens with it. So the first time it may be a push. It may be a push. The next time it may be a push and a grab. Then it may be a push and a grab and a shake. Then it may be a push, a grab, a shake, and a slap. A push, a grab, a shake, a slap, and a choke. A push, a grab, a shake, a slap, a grab, a choke, a punch. And and it may be soft, then it's harder, then it's a two-punch combination, then a three-punch combination, and it may go from, you know, the thighs to the arm to the chest, and it continues to escalate. And as long as, and see what happens is, is because the seeds of abuse were not recognized when they were planted, they then take root and then they sprout and it grows into something much bigger than you can control. And before you know it, you've been drug along for three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, fifteen 10, 11, 12, 15 years. And in year 15, you are punched in the mouth and you lose two of your teeth. But when you really look at it, you were being yelled at and cursed at in year one and two. And though that was the antecedent behavior that you overlooked and ignored or you mislabeled and you stayed in it, so you reinforced it. And then you got deeper and deeper into it. So now you have a child together. Then you have a home together. Then you have child number two together. Now you have a car together. Then you have two cars together. Now it gets so deep and then you're, you're public. Everybody knows. Then you get a little praise because you can put on a good face for the public. So you get praise for being this strong, beautiful power couple in your community. And so now all this other stuff comes into play and now it becomes that much harder to walk away from the abuse because you have kids, you have cars, you have a home, you have a reputation in the community, you have some respect, some love from other people, have some people even envying you, but they don't know you're behind the scenes. They see your highlight reel, not your behind the scenes, and it puts more pressure on you, and now you feel stuck. You feel trapped. How can I leave? How can I walk away? Because... I have kids, we have a home together, or I haven't gotten the ring yet, or I got the ring and we're married and I don't believe in divorce. And so now you face all of these things. And one thing that is for sure is if abuse is happening in any form and you stay, your presence sanctions it. And a lot of people say, you know, it's unfair to say, oh, you should just leave. And that, you know, leaving is what can make an abuser kill you. And it's kind of like a gamble and no one really knows. So it, it has to be a personal choice. And so you have to ask yourself, you know, you have to ask yourself, do I stay and live on my knees or do I calculate and escape and try to leave and hope that I can leave and, and live? And that's the choice that people are making every day. They're, they're, they're taking a chance, they're, they're taking a gamble, and they're making their choice. And that's a personal choice. That's something that no one really can advise you on. But so for me, 
You know, if you're in that situation, it becomes down to, you know, it comes down to you knowing what you're in and you knowing your options, leave or stay, and then you weighing, you know, the pros and the cons and you making a decision. But if you're not in that situation, if you are just, you're still dating, if it hasn't gotten physical yet, if if the crazy hasn't been reinforced enough that you feel it could become violent yet, you have a decision to make. It's earlier for you. So for me, I really believe in the ounce of prevention over the pound of cure. And so if you are in a place right now where you are single and dating or getting ready to date or you're in a relationship, but it's not too, too deep yet, and it, and it can be marriage, too. It can be marriage. A lot of times people get stuck because they're in marriage and they say, oh, I can't leave. Look, if it's abusive and it's getting worse and worse or you see the seeds being planted right now, the seeds of abuse, you can leave. Don't feel like anything has you bound or like you have to stay in a situation that can turn very ugly because you cannot play with crazy. You cannot negotiate with crazy. You cannot, you know, reinforce crazy. And what I mean by that is a person, any of us are capable of developing a mental health issue if the maladaptive behaviors we are exhibiting are reinforced. If those behaviors are reinforced over and over and over, it will continue to develop something in our mind that says, this is okay. This is what you can do. This is, you are being rewarded for this behavior. So keep it up. And you can take a, a, a sane person will become a crazy person from the moments of weakness that they have. And they exhibit a maladaptive behavior. And then that behavior is reinforced by their spouse or their partner. That person is developing something in their brain that tells them this behavior is recognized and rewarded. And so keep this up because you're getting the response or the, or the reaction that you need. And this is getting you your way. And a sane person over time becomes a crazy person. So you have to look at your relationship. Look at your relationship. Look at what you have in front of you, whether you're in one now or you're going to be in one. Look at it, evaluate it, see what behaviors are being exhibited, and see what you are reinforcing. And then ask yourself, am I reinforcing the right or the wrong behaviors? And do I need to really look in the mirror and make a decision right now on whether I should leave or stay? And if it's abusive in any way, shape, or form, my answer is always to leave. And and if it hasn't happened yet and you and it does happen, one of the red flags shows up, you have the opportunity then to check it. And I and I'll tell you the truth, that's what really changed my life because before my wife, you know, I was in toxic relationship after toxic relationship. I was toxic, controlling and one of the worst, and that was common, that was normal. Every guy I knew was the same as me. I probably, one out of a hundred, were different. It just was so common with athletes and jocks. You know, you have all the ladies, you can do what you want to do with, with women, and, you know, they put up with and accept anything you bring to the table, and it just was sad and ridiculous, but that, and you knew it was sad and ridiculous, but that behavior is being reinforced, so... You don't see any value of doing anything different because you being maladaptive is being praised and rewarded. Even if it's, you know, unintentional, it's still being praised and rewarded by, by the woman. And then when I met my wife, any behavior that was outside of her comfort zone that she was not okay with, she checked it. She checked it. She spoke right to it. She called it out, said, look, do not give me your word and then not keep it. Check me on it. Listen, don't raise your voice at me. Check me on it. 
So when I was being checked on the small things, on the red flags, it let me know this woman is not here to play. If I cannot plant these seeds of abuse or control, disrespect, then this cannot grow into anything else. So what I had to do is uproot. I had to uproot those seeds. I had to dig them up and I had to plant new seeds, seeds of love, kindness, generosity, compassion. And that is what she reinforced and allowed to take root. And that is what grew into what we have today and just celebrated 11 years of marriage, happy, healthy marriage, what I would call a perfect relationship. And the reason why I call it a perfect relationship is because she doesn't put up with any crap. And by her not putting up with any crap, it taught me not to put up with any crap. So neither one of us put up with anything that is outside of our comfort zone of love and respect. Anything that doesn't fall inside of the zone of love and respect, we check it at the door. We call it out filled with self-love, and that requires both of us to bring our best to the table. And by bringing our best to the table and being 100% selfless, it creates a healthy, happy, perfect relationship. And it is possible, and people don't believe it because people don't set standards for their life and for the people who come into their life. And that is why relationships break and fall apart. So, hey, listen, I hope that helped you. Make sure you need more. Get to TonyGaskinsAcademy.com and get the Real Love course. Sit with it. Watch a video a day and watch it over and over and over. TonyGaskinsAcademy.com, Real Love University. Get that. I made it only $10 so that there's no excuse. But make sure you get that course and learn to love yourself. Learn to recognize the red flag and build healthy and happy relationships in your life, friends, family, and your spouse. Hey, this is Tony Gaskins. Thank you so much. Look, if you have a question for me, send it in to inbox at TonyGaskins.com. Inbox at TonyGaskins.com. Thank you.